I want to share with you a resource that I've been working on the last four years. We read in Matthew's Gospel that Jesus' last words to the 12 folks he invested his life in were to go and make disciples of all nations. I'd been pastoring for over 30 years and had to honestly ask, are we truly making disciples who are being transformed into Jesus' revolutionary kingdom worldview? or simply church attenders who use Jesus to endorse their own political ideologies. I took our leadership team on a three-day retreat to really wrestle with this question. If our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, what does a disciple look like? We identified three key characteristics. A disciple has undiluted devotion to Jesus as Lord, a kingdom of God worldview, and a missional lifestyle. Four years ago, I made the commitment to develop a three-part curriculum for groups to work through. The first project was Renegade Gospel, Rebel Jesus. The second has just been released, Revolutionary Kingdom, Following the Rebel Jesus. I want you to meet four visionary young pastors from around the country who spent two days in my home working on this six-session DVD that accompanies the Leader's Guide and Book. Take a look at session one as my friends discuss Jesus' understanding of the kingdom of God. Being a pastor at Gingensburg Church for 38 years, I saw that we had been effective at drawing crowds, but crowds do not disciples make. Yeah. And why Jesus was skeptical of crowds and would always say things to diminish the size you know, of crowds. But three days we wrestled with this question, what is a, a disciple? And, and we came up with three things. Uh, we said undiluted devotion to Jesus as Lord. We said a kingdom of God worldview. And, and why we said kingdom of God worldview, we couldn't just say biblical because uh, how many different ways people mm -hmm. interpret scripture, but to understand the kingdom of God. And, and then the third was a missional lifestyle. You know, when you, when you think of your ministry, what, what is a disciple? Mike, I remember probably 10 years ago, you saying something, so you can, you can say the exact quote, but here's Gingensburg mega church, large church. And at that time when you were mentoring me, you were saying uh, you'd rather have, I don't remember the number, but it was like, tw <laughs> you know, this number of people that yeah. would what storm yeah. the gates of hell than this huge thing. And I think that's a really, uh, that caught my attention as uh, as a younger pastor to think, what are, what are we really going after? And, and what are we really doing at that same time is when we were uh, putting together the pieces to start our, our new church. And so we tried to put those building blocks in. I think it's really similar. We have a different way of of saying it, but we're looking uh, for people who will seek God with all of their heart, who will welcome every person, uh, who offer Christ, sort of a Wesleyan kind of uh, component there, where Wesley would say, offer them Christ, and then that they'll respond in every way by serving. So we kind of have these four components that for us are trying to to dial down to the disciple. And what we see is the, the crowd will never do that, you know, the, but, mm. but you will find those folks who who will go in deeper and commit and you do, you know, you need some handholds, you know, like you, like you mentioned yeah. for people to know what that means. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, um, those times when I want to get frustrated that more people aren't believing, behaving, belonging in community the way that I think they should as disciples. I have to, also have to remember that Jesus, while he always challenged people to a deep discipleship was very comfortable with the crowd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that a, a good church shouldn't be a room full of disciples. Mm, yeah. I mean, I think that's really important. Ooh. That a good church is not a room full of disciples. Mm -hmm. yeah. A good church is some disciples with, with a crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what a good church is and what pastors ought to look for is, is their church a funnel? In other words, is it moving people step by step? And it's steps and it's mm -hmm. slow sometimes. But are, are you moving people from crowd to follower? But I, mm -hmm. I don't what, wouldn't want pastors to get frustrated that they look out and they think, well, most of my people are uh, nowhere near this. That's, that's so that's so helpful because I do, I think sometimes we can reduce the things of faith almost into a formula, 
X plus Y will equal Z. Or if you go from this step to this step to this step to this step, you've kind of had the spiritual arrival or spiritual elitism. And we forget that it really is by the work of the Holy Spirit that people are changed and transformed. Um, if yes. we look at our own kind of autobiographies, um, I, 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 I am not um, where I can be, but I'm definitely not where I used to be. Mm -hmm. And I give God thanks and praise over and over again for God's grace uh, in the midst of the process, which probably should remind me to also have grace for others, that they're in process. We, we tend to use these two terms badly, your before and after. And, um, and I think it's more like we, we know the old self and then we are being made into something else as opposed to, ta-da, you know, um, <laughs> all should be made well. Because I actually think that people start to do some self-flogging when, they, when they're wondering um, why sh should I not look like the person to the left or to yeah. the right when actually we have to honor the fact that God is always at work in us. This discipleship thing isn't just for us about a definition. It's about helping to teach people to live a whole new way of, of life. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy for us, whoever us is, to point to the other and say, well, you're not a disciple of mm -hmm. Jesus. Um, there's a lot of self-reflection that I think needs to happen in the American church today. We can still like draw a crowd of people, but um, do these people actually follow the Christ mm -hmm. that they so often proclaim they serve? Because, I mean, every day I'm asking questions like, are marriages really better? Mm. You know, like, are, are folks actually nice to their neighbors? You know, um, who, who are they eating mm -hmm. with? Who are they dining with? And um, are we really more concerned with where our political aspirations lie? I mean, uh, we are a very diverse uh, congregation when it comes to politics. Um, and so um, how do we love each other and love each other well? There are sometimes, like, I don't even know if people sitting next to each other even love each other, mm. uh, even like each other, let alone love each other. Jesus never asked what folks believed or anything mm. when he sat down and ate with these folks. I mean, I, the big word on him was, he, you hang out with sinners, mm. and, which is very different than so much of the institutional church. And I think it's really important, you know, this book's important because a church it ought to have a crowd and then it ought to not be satisfied with that. It yeah, ought to be yeah. constantly inviting people to something. So I think clarity about what a disciple is and then comfort with uh, being in community with people who aren't disciples to me really captures what was so amazing about Jesus is he never let up on the intensity of what he thought uh, living into the kingdom of God required. And he had this amazing non-anxious presence <laughs> among a crowd of people who are in all different places. What I love about Jesus, Alan Hirsch talks about how he allowed people to belong and then they become. And the church mm. some years yeah. back got that reverse where you have to become this way. You have to you know, know where to find everything in your Bible. Mm. You have to become this and then you can belong to the community. And that's the complete opposite mm. of what Jesus, you know, follow me, had all these people on the road. So it is a mess, right? <laughs> um, but it's not a, it, there, can, there can be intentional ways in the midst of that, that we get people moving, moving in that direction. One of the, the uh, things that's so important is like when we talk about a, a, a kingdom of God worldview, what does that mean to you? What, it, what, it, what does the kingdom of God mean to you? That was the gospel of Jesus. You know, I, I, I was a Christian for some time before I really discovered that Jesus proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom of God. You know, I think, Mike, I've been so well discipled by you that um, every day that I pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't have this understanding of like, I just want to make it to heaven. Hmm. I'm praying for heaven to come from uh, from heaven to earth. I want to experience heaven right here, right now. Um, but I feel like I have balance in that, in that uh, I know that not everyone throughout the world is experiencing heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. And so that's where my heart breaks. That's where the challenge is. Uh, how am I using all of the gifts and uh, all the influence that we have in order to experience heaven on earth? And if we're going to talk about a kingdom, we have to under understand the king who's totally upside mm. down from every king I've yeah. ever read or watched. He didn't build buildings and put his name on it. He didn't store up gold. He didn't push pe a people grew out, people group out to get land. He didn't, you know, have grapes fed down. He's mm. a totally different kind of king. Yeah. And so if we're going to talk about kingdom, we have to really understand uh, this very different king who rode on, you know, the colt of mm. a donkey in the town. Mm. Jesus is peace. 
Jesus is bread from heaven. Jesus is water that will never run dry. Jesus is resurrection in life. So where there is no water, where there is no peace, mm-hmm. where there is no bread, where there is no life, we should um, we should say that is not king. That's not kingdom. And when right. we are not also living into that, we should say we're not living into the into the kingdom or helping the the kingdom kiss earth. Yeah. Um, I think what's problematic is that so many people are can settle on the world as it is. I um, now I've been out of the local church almost two years, and so uh, Carolyn and I traveling to so many different local churches. I've become a bit cynical. And again, I, th- I say to you all who are uh, 30 years younger than I am, um, is that uh, I, we've worked at this all my ministry, and it's we've still got a long, long way to go. And we see with the, the rise of uh, racism, I had people leave, leave the church because I brought an African-American uh, singer in. I've had women in leadership since 1980s, was our first woman pastor. You know, a majority of Christianity still exclude women around the world from, uh, you know, leadership. Uh, do you, so you see where I'm cynical and where do we see pockets of, of hope of, of the presence of, of the kingdom? You said in your book where you, the, the way you got over your cynicism was you went to some church and went to the basement and sat yeah, down <laughs> with people who were you know, being fed and, and that restore, you, you know, you get to see the marks of the kingdom. Yeah. The further away we get from that, you know, I call it the further toward the center of the circle, so to speak. Hmm. And and we're not out where the the gospel is meeting the lives of real people. The more cynical I become and the closer I get to where the gospel is meeting people, which, you know, in a big church, you're pulled toward the center. Hmm. When you start becoming important, even in the church, yeah. you're actually becoming less important hmm. in the kingdom. Hmm.